uh, as said, I'm Alex Bonoff from the University of Exeter in the United Kingdom, and I'll be talking to you about the effect of permafrost on preserving strontium isotope ratios in dentine. There we go. Um, so as we all know, strontium isotopes show a spatial variation uh, due to processes such as the underlying geology, input of sediments through uh, wind and water processes, which makes it excellent for provenance studies to determine where something or someone came from, but also for mobility, so whether a human or an animal in the past migrated. Now, the common practice for strontium isotope analyses is to analyze enamel, whereas dentine is very often used as a proxy to, to, to determine the local signal or so local range in strontium isotope ratios against which the enamel can then be compared. And if there's an agreement, it shows that this individual or uh, animal probably grew up locally, whereas if there's a disagreement, there's uh, reason to suspect that this animal or individual migrated. And the reason for this is diagenesis. So enamel is much more mineralized, much more bioappetite uh, compared to dentine, which gives it a highly crystalline structure, whereas dentine has a much higher organic content, has a lot of collagen, which makes it porous in structure. And this allows strontium to much, uh, this enables strontium to get into dentine much easier, where it can exchange with strontium that's already in the bioappetite of dentine. It can form new crystals or simply uh, strontium by itself can get stuck in the dentine. Um, and so no pretreatment protocols have yet been developed that can completely remove all this diagenetic strontium from the dentine. It's shown by various studies, such as this one by Trickett et al, in which the dashed line is the local signal, the local range in strontium isotope ratios. Circles are the enamel, and the triangles are the dentine. And there's a very clear difference between the strontium isotope ratios in the enamel versus the strontium isotope ratios in the dentine, which are much closer to the local range, uh, therefore showing that these have been affected by diagenesis. And similar to study by Bodedal from 2000, in which this case, the triangles are in the enamel, the circles on the dentine. Again, regardless of whether the enamel had higher or lower strontium isotope ratios compared to the local signal, the dentine is much closer uh, and has clearly been affected by diagenesis. Uh, one of the questions I had is whether dentine could be used as the main analyte, so whether dentine can be used to answer those questions of whether an animal migrate or it came from a different region under the right conditions. In this case, what I'm wondering about is whether it uh, is permafrost. Uh, one of the reasons you might want to consider using dentine rather than enamel is, for example, in very poor conservation. This is a mammoth motor as I encountered it when I was on a sampling trip in St. Petersburg just before the COVID pandemic uh, commenced. And as you can see, the enamel, which is the, the white stuff, is completely deteriorated. It's cracked, it's become dust after this only like 10 to 15 years in storage in St. Petersburg, where you can get very cold winds, very warm summers. And this fluctuation in temperature has a detrimental effect on the enamel, whereas collagen, because of its higher collagen, uh, dentine, because of its higher collagen content, is much more flexible, much more malleable, and it moves more with these temperature ranges. And as you can see, the inside of these so-called loaves, as they're called in mammoth motors, the dentine is still excellently preserved, whereas the enamel is completely gone. So if we can analyze this dentine, we can still learn something about the behavior of this mammoth. This might also be the case for excavations that we can place for, let's say, 100 years ago. Another reason might pertain particularly to proboscideans, so mammoths and elephants and mastodons, because in animal you can only analyze from molars, and molars only cover a certain part of an animal's life. If you've only got the first molar, then from the first few years of its life, you have the last molar, in the case for mammoths, the M6. You cover, let's say, the last maybe 15, 20 years of their lives. Tusks on the end, which are unique to proboscideans, consist completely of dentine, but they are ever growing. Uh, the permanent tusks of mammoths start growing when they're about one, two years old until they die. And this offers you a near complete lifetime of isotopes. You can really study the differences in the behavior of mammoths from when they were very young, when they were neonates, through their adolescence, up to adulthood and their death. And that's something that Matthew Wooder, for example, has done with a mammoth tusk from Alaska, the graph on the right, 
Jungus Tronsimeister brachios changed quite a lot throughout their life, learning that this animal uh, started migrating more and more as it got older. And this is something you can only do with the tusks and the dentine. But to study effects of permafrost on the preservation of Strontium brachios in dentine, I used the case study of the Yana Rhinoceros horn site in Russia. It's one of the oldest sites in the Arctic, very far north. And as you can see on the map on the right, everything in blue, those are ice wedges which have created these islands of archaeology that used to be a single um, level, but have now been torn apart by these very cold, very thick ice wedges. And also the archaeology itself is now in permafrost, which makes the excavations very difficult, but it has enabled excellent preservation of bone and teeth. Uh, it must be said the Yana Rhinoceros horn site is actually more of a site complex, it consists of several sites along the Yana riverbank. Um, but the dates from all of these sites are very similar. They all fall around 32,000 years ago. Um, and the, the, the technological culture is very similar. So it is believed that it is all one site, uh, one location, one occupation phase um, spread over different localities. Now, previously, I've already analyzed enamel of several uh, animals from Yana. These were a bison, a mammoth, and a reindeer that I selected to continue with for the dentine. And all of these individuals have yielded non-local Strontium operations, thus making it excellent to see whether the dentine also could yield these non-local Strontium operations. Uh, when we did radiocarbon dating, however, it, showed, uh, it turned out that the bison that we had analyzed is, is much older, actually, than archaeology. And that is an infinite radiocarbon date. But the mammoth and the reindeer uh, do fall within the range of the archaeology. So they're about 32,000 years old if you do calibrate those radiocarbon dates. The method we used was laser ablation. Uh, we used laser ablation because it offers a near continuous analysis of strontium isotope ratios, thereby ensuring that if there are any minor fluctuations in strontium isotope ratios, we we'll, would not miss them. Whereas you do have the, the, the chance that you do miss some minor fluctuations using the conventional intratooth method of taking a sample every one, two millimeters. And also we were able to place parallel tracks. So in the image on the right, for example, you can see the red and the black line. Uh, these are a very simplified uh, schematic overview of the laser tracks we placed in both the enamel and the dentine alongside each other. This is the result for the bison that had previously been analyzed. In black is the enamel, in dark gray is the dentine, transmitted to abrasion, and then the shaded area is what we had, de in, we had determined to be the local range in transmitted to abrasions, and it's from the M2 and M3 of this bison. As you can see, the results are quite similar. They both show very much non local transmitted to abrasions, both show this little uh, peak and valley around 55 millimeters from the enamel root junction of start off in the local range and end up going down towards the local range again, with the dentine having maybe been affected minorly by a genesis in the middle part. In the end, we do have a quite a strong disagreement between the dentine and the enamel, but it's likely because the dentine, we, we went into the root of the molar, whereas the enamel had already stopped forming by that time. We have a similar result for the mammoth. Uh, we sampled an M6, so the last huge motor of this mammoth, which was split up into three bits. Again, showing very much non-local strontium to ratios in both the dentine and the enamel, of slightly different phases, uh, but both show very clear peaks and throughs uh, occurring at similarly uh, the same rate and same distances. Now, a very different result we had was for the reindeer where the enamel clearly shows non-local strontium isotope ratios and the dentine very clearly being affected by diagenetic strontium because the dentine nearly completely uh, agrees with the local range, which the enamel does not. And so if you would only analyze the dentine from this reindeer, you would incorrectly assume that this individual did not migrate in the past, whereas if you analyze the enamel, it shows very clearly that this animal moved to a different region and then came to the Yana region towards the end of its M3. So there are some minor differences between the strong semester ratios of the enamel and the dentine, as you may have seen. And this can be very easily explained by differences in the formation and the mineralization processes that occur in dentine and are in enamel and are slightly different. And 
such differences have also been observed previously between the dentine and the enamel of a uh, cow in their carbon values in this article by Zeso et al. 2006. The difference between the individuals is a bit harder to explain why did the reindeer uh, show this very clear effect of diagenesis, whereas the bison and the mammoth did not. One of the things I was thinking about is the, the, the preservation conditions beyond permafrost. Uh, as I said, the Yana consists of different localities, and most of them are all are located above se about seven and a half meters to eight meters above the river water level. So, for example, Yana, Northern Point, Yana and P, where the reindeer was found, about seven and a half meters above water level. The bison and mammoth both came from the locality called YMM, the Yana Mass Accumulation of Mammoth, which is located in this dip that is approximately at water level, and water level does fluctuate quite a lot. It's a river over there. So four times this um, bison and mammoth molar uh, would have been submerged in water, further increasing its preservation besides the permafrost. But regardless of where we took bones from, whether it was from YMM or Yana and P, Legend preservation was excellent at every location. Everywhere we found at least 15% of the bones consisting of collagen, which is very close to modern levels of collagen yields uh, from modern bones. So preservation uh, is likely not an explanation uh, for the difference between the reindeer, the bison, and the mammoth. A more parsimonious explanation, we think, is that the reindeer teeth had not completely developed. The roots were still open, the pulp chamber was still available to set sediments. Indeed, when we took these samples, we did find sediments within the pulp chamber of these reindeer motors, whereas this was not the case for the mammoth or the bison. So strontium had a much uh, more increased contact area, contact surface, from and from within the molar, it could affect the strontium isotope ratios of the dentine. What this means for free triplications is that it's still very much preferable to use enamel as your main ally to answer your questions whether an animal or a human migrated or if they were local or not local. And But this also means, on the other hand, that the team may not always be a reliable proxy to determine what your local strontium ratio is because it can preserve authentic strontium isotope ratios. If you do want to use uh, dentine, however, from permafrost to answer your main research questions, whether an animal migrated or not, try to select teeth that have uh, closed molar roots, so as little uh, strontium and soil can get into those molars, preferably also while they are still embedded in mandibles or maxillas, but it's hard to assess, of course, whether molar roots are closed when they're still embedded in bone. Um, and if you do use proboscidean tusks, try to use tusks that are very well preserved and have as few cracks as possible. Um, and always, if you do analyze dentine, go for the innermost dentine. So go for the dentine that is closest to the dentine enamel junction, furthest away from surfaces where strontium could have leached into the dentine from surrounding soils. With that, I would like to thank you all for uh, having me here uh, through the NERC GW, GW4 Plus for funding this research and everyone on the slide for supervising, supporting, or providing materials. If anyone still has any questions after the discussion, feel free to email me.